Danielle, Michelle, April, and Brooklyn. Trauma, resilience, and self-determination for women of color entrepreneurs. Please welcome them to the stage. We are so excited to be here. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the first day and a half of your time at Tech Inclusion. Um, I feel very fortunate. My name is Danielle DeRyder Williams. I feel very fortunate to be holding space for this conversation. Uh, when uh, I had the thought with my with my partners at the Justice Collective of what we wanted to propose, what we wanted to talk about, um, if we could, if we had the opportunity at Tech Inclusion, it would be something that we talk about all the time, which is the ways in which our identities as women of color uh, are absolute assets in the work that we do, not only as entrepreneurs, but as folks who are driving social impact in the world. When I thought about who would be really great to have, you know, hold this conversation and hold this container with me on stage, these three folks certainly came to mind. I'm going to give each of them an opportunity to uh, share a little bit about themselves, and then we'll launch into our conversation. April, do you want to get us started? Yeah, it works. Hey, everybody. Yeah, that's right. Before lunch, we got it. This is a tough crowd, right? Um, I am so excited to be here and grateful to share this stage um, with you all. I know you're going to bring some really good conversations. So my name is April Fanal. I'm a Bay Area native. I am the founder and CEO of Pickup. We're a socially responsible delivery hub that caters to uh, food businesses and retail businesses. We are the alternative to some of the other uh, companies out there. And the reason I started that work was because people weren't able to show up at the workplace as a whole person. So what I mean by that is all those different things that you identify as. First, I'm a black woman. I'm also a sexually fluid, same-sex married person with a disability, formerly incarcerated mother, daughter, sister, and the list can go on but can I show up in the workplace as all of those people? And can I be seen as all of those people in a safe space? So I created Pickup so that folks would have an opportunity to do just that and do purposeful work at the end of the day that they could feel like they knew what the hell they were doing it for. Um, I'm in my 40s and you know, it comes a time when you're like, what is it all for? I'm just punching the clock, I'm just pushing paper around, like clocking in, clocking out, I'm going home. On that, that hamster wheel of getting a check, paying my bills, repeat. You know, what is it all for? So um, in my work, I hope to provide that space for our team members. Um, in addition, we build out a training program that is the only training program that focuses on empowering individuals that come from underrepresented groups to have a, uh, a sustainable lifestyle to take care of themselves and their family um, in the logistics space. Uh, currently, you know, I don't, I don't see it happening in a really authentic way of how we're leveraging labor it's just that, it's labor that people just get to go in and uh, work for, I'll just say it, they get to work with Amazon, they get to work with all these other you know, big companies as, as labor, but what's the real takeaway for them? And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to change that. Thank you very much. Brooklyn? Sweet, I am Brooklyn uh, Wright. I started a company called Boy Society, which is a, we're a brand and network that crosses 22 countries, um, and we specifically talk to women, people of color, and LGBTQ people across the world. Um, I took that work, parlayed that into being able to talk to that specific group in tech and media, and to actually highlight you guys' stories and make you more seen and actually bridge the gaps of access. Um, that's my short version. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. I am so honored and excited to be on this panel with these three amazing women of color. Um, I'm Michelle Kim. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Awaken. We provide experiential and interactive diversity and inclusion workshops at tech companies and beyond. So we work with a lot of different types of organizations. And our mission is to create compassionate space for uncomfortable conversations. Uh, the company was started by myself and my co-founder, Beatrice Kim, 
with the mission that, you know, there's a lot of diversity trainings out there that just barely scratch the surface. Um, and I was really frustrated that, you know, these conversations around diversity and inclusion wasn't actually making a lot of changes in people's hearts and minds or behaviors or culture. So there's a lot of you know, bullshit conversations, bullshit training that people do to just check the box. And I felt that it's time for us to go a little bit deeper. Uh, so I have background in both um, change management and consulting, but also I used to work in tech. Um, but really my passion and grassroots uh, work has been in social justice world. So I'm trying to bridge the gap in the kind of conversations that we're having. And in conversations around trauma today, I think um, a big mission for me is how do we do this education work around diversity and inclusion, not at the expense of marginalized people in the room, and how do we not re-traumatize people in the process of doing this work. Uh, so that's uh, my passion, and that's why I'm here, and I'm super excited. Thanks to the three of you. Uh, a little bit about me, and then I, I we'll get into the questions. Um, I co-founded the Justice Collective back in 2015, really with an intention to uh, work with companies and organizations and leverage the power of identity to advance equity, diversity, and inclusion, both in organizational culture, in process and policy, uh, but also in kind of building that internal capacity of folks who are leading this work inside of organizations. Uh, and we, uh, TJC, leverages a collective model. So we have our leadership team, but then we have a whole pool of consultants, some of whom are in the audience, uh, that we're able to build these tailor-made teams and, and really meet the needs of, of, of our client partners um, uh, by matching them with folks who are able to leverage their own identities to support that work inside of, of these organizations. So I'm super excited to share the stage with, with these folks. This is a curveball question. It's really not a curveball, but it wasn't on our list of, of two other questions. But I am interested to know, because I have a background in um, uh, uh, city planning. So I was in a big institution, a big white institution uh, here in San Francisco, and there's a the reason why entrepreneurship really resonated with me as a career choice, uh, a lot of that has to do with trauma. And I would love to just hear, you know, in so much as you, any of you would like to share the, you know, the role that, that, that trauma of being inside of an institution that is not representative of you, that can be oppressive, has, uh, you know, um, uh, supported your choice around entrepreneurship. I mean, mine has, so I did not mean to start my business. Um, I was <laughs> blessed enough to create this thing online that kind of just blew up and became this thing that I did. And that I turned into a business. So, and it's, it's, it's based off of my identity, right? So we're queer people of color. It's really based in fashion. So it has a lot to do with presenting masculinely and kind of all these things. And so it's been my trauma has actually ended up being really great for me because um, it made this whole space for me to exist and to find people who were like me to exist. Um, and so I feel very blessed to do the work that I do. Um, but it, it, yes, it's very much so based in trauma and, and all of the things, but it's turned out okay. Yeah. Um, trauma for me has uh, kind of happened in stages. Um, it wasn't uh, an accident that I started pickup, but what I found was definitely I, I wasn't prepared for all of the trauma in my own personal life that was going to come up in that and all of the trauma of all of my team members and the, and the over 100 folks that I've interviewed that were going to come up. Um, and that was just like, whoa, I, I'm on to something here, not as something to monetize, but something to show people how to flip the narrative, that the trauma didn't always have to be this debilitating um, thing or this thing that you had to be ashamed of or this thing that you had to like keep tucked away that you could uh, talk about that at the very beginning and, and quite frankly, as employees, it's something that you should be looking for in your employer that, that they're addressing trauma in some way that is healthy. Um, and so we're talking about culture, that, that needs to be like out in the open. Um, in one of our team meetings, I said, you know, we do like these check-ins, and I kind of got that from uh, up to my business boot camp, uh, where they would allow you like a few minutes just to say what's happening in your personal life instead of just hopping into the work. 
And in my head, I'm like, man, F this. You know, you're on the clock. Like, I want to <laughs> just move this along. But in my heart, I'm like, we actually need to take a pause and we need to talk about things that are happening in the real, in the world because they're actually happening in the workplace. Um, so I can't pretend to come in to work and, and like I'm not affected by, um, you know, Nia's murder at MacArthur Bard Station or <laughs> police brutality. I cannot act like that isn't affecting me and just start my day. So we need to be checking in to acknowledge the trauma around us and the trauma that is triggered in us and how we can have healthy conversations just to say, "Woo, I know I can't do anything about this, but I'm feeling fucked up right now. You know what I mean? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot about the way in which the boundary between what's happening in the real world and what's happening in us as individuals and then how we bring that into the workplace is a permeable border. It's not a border at all, right? Um, I remember very distinctly an experience wherein uh, my father relapsed on drugs. This was just in January. And uh, I immediately flew home to Michigan and I missed a meeting uh, when I was working in the planning department in which a very big decision was made about my project. Um, and I couldn't be there. Uh, it was not a decision that had to be made that day. It was a decision that could have waited, right? Um, but because uh, I wasn't in the room, my voice wasn't heard. Um, if we know anything about the history of America, we know that uh, the experience of black Americans and, uh, you know, and drug addiction has a long um, and very messy and very problematic history. So there's the way in which the larger societal kind of history and structures continues to seep its way into our own individual opportunities to show up and to be seen and to have our voices heard. Um, so that's just, that was really present for me. Thank you for, for highlighting that, April. Um, Michelle. I'm wondering if you could share a bit about, uh, you know, the importance of um, not re-traumatizing uh, women of color kind of in the workplace and how that shows up in the work that you do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to start this company and do diversity and inclusion training differently um, was largely because of that fact, where I felt like as an audience member or as a you know participant um, inside these companies attending these workshops, I felt as though a lot of times I felt a lot of the pain and trauma that I had as a woman of color, as a queer person, as an immigrant, a lot of the real issues that I was feeling weren't being addressed by the person who's facilitating the room or who had the power inside the room. So I think sort of really talking about the real issues for me was missing and therefore trivializing or invalidating a lot of the lived experiences of people and treating DNI as this extracurricular, you know, fun, happy thing, right, that we all benefit from because of the, the business case and whatnot. And I felt like that wasn't really doing justice to our lived experiences that I know I had and a lot of my peers had. Um, and then I think another thing that's happening a lot these days is there's a lot of educational burden being put on marginalized people inside companies. And so I wanted to eliminate that as well, or at least shift the burden a little bit around how we're doing emotional labor, how we're doing educational labor, and really valuing that work um, and thinking strategically about, you know, why should we put that kind of burden on our internal people if that's not their full-time job? Right, because they're already dealing with a lot of the experiences that they need to overcome on their day-to-day -day experiences. You know, really think about what kind of burden y'all are putting on your employees um, to do that kind of educational work when their full-time job isn't that. Uh, so I wanted to really shift that um, narrative around who you know should be doing that kind of work. Um, and I think in terms of not re-traumatizing people, I'm also really conscious about the kind of companies that we partner with. So we have uh, a majority POC, majority queer people of color um, facilitators. And for me, it's really important that we're not actually partnering with companies who are kind of doing you know this leaning back and asking prove to me this is important, right? Because that's not my work. That's not the work that we should be doing. Um, I, there's enough business case out there for people to know that this stuff is important. Um, and if they're not there yet, then I know that the, the work that we do is not going to be valued and seen as valuable. 
Um, so I think part of that, this work for me, is how do we make sure that our team who's doing this work, that's a ton of emotional labor, that we're also caring for ourselves so that we can continue doing this work without traumatizing ourselves over and over and over again in these spaces. Um, so I think you know, really being conscious about setting those boundaries for me um, as a CEO has been really important. Thank you for that. I I'm interested to know, and maybe Brooklyn, you can kick us off on this. Um, if each of you have a story about the way in which your resiliency that you've grown just a part of your lived experiences, your identity, et cetera, has actually been a huge asset, if a story comes to mind in particular. Uh, it's my whole story. I mean, the only reason I'm sitting here is because of that, right? Like, it's been it's been my work. I dived into it, and then I wanted to find ways that I could continue to do the work on like a larger scale, um, and which was surprising to me that it brought me to tech. I didn't expect that, um, <laughs> but obviously, you guys have a lot of work to do, and <laughs> let's just, let's call a thing a thing, sure. right? She's right? Like this is a very toxic environment to be in. In fact, I'll tell you a story. Um, I had one of my first big tech meetings a couple of weeks ago, right? We're planning an ad campaign to really spread the voices of people of color, women, and LGBTQ people in tech. Um, and the first, one of the first companies we sat down with, I won't out them, um, simply because they're making it better. Uh, but they almost verbally assaulted me, right? Their VP of people came in had all the great things to say. They believed in empowering women. They believed in empowering uh, LGBT people. And, and then they sit to me and they said, but you know what I can't stand? I can't stand black girl magic. <laughs> and literally, to my face, I'm sitting here and this is what you say to me. So you were okay to empower everyone except for black women specifically, that they thought just having black girl magic was divisive. And so, you know, as much as that's a positive conversation, because it then led us to have a conversation with the CEO, and on and on and on and on and on, and we're gonna make them cut a check uh, for to learn their things. But, I mean, I'm traumatized on my first meeting. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm not here, I'm not here every day. I'm not like you guys, I'm not doing the work in tech. Um, so I, I feel very blessed to sit here and represent all of you um, and to make those pathways and to be that person who gets to kind of take on that assault and then do something about it. Um, but it, it shapes my whole life and my whole career. Thank you. Um, great question. I have so many stories. <laughs> um, so like quickly, like when I, when I moved back from Sacramento to the Bay Area, I'm from Richmond, California. But when I moved back, I rebranded myself. I thought I could work and continue working in higher education and it just didn't happen as quickly. So I learned how to do something else. So I taught myself how to code. Eh, enough to break some shit, right? But so I taught myself enough to code to get hired. And I got hired at a, at a, a Drupal shop and immediately already feeling some imposter syndrome, right? Because I'm so new at this. Um, they were using language like, that's gay. And I was, and it was like a very cis male, white cis male environment. And they were using language like, I'm gay. And I just couldn't speak up on that. I didn't have the words, you know, I, I just didn't know what to say other than knowing I felt so uncomfortable and wished that they would stop, right? So that was like, just like one of the, the first, but it left a real uh, impression on me that I don't want to be a part of this. You know, so I stayed there for like six months and then, you know, I left. But another story of um, just that resilience, I feel like as a black woman, as a woman, that word, it's just like as automatic as breathing. We are just resilient because we don't have an option. You fall, you're expected to get the hell up. And so you are resilient versus you fail. You're like, oh my God, I fell. I've never failed before and no one let you fall. And uh, you know, there's all of that. And so you don't know what that's like to, to be bruised or to be um, um, injured, um, right? So my, my last story that I'll share with you has, was uh, pretty recent. And I think that we all have to be responsible for finding our voice to be brave enough to, to speak and when it's just so uncomfortable to do so. 
So I watched a tape about uh, tech inclusion because I just had to for last year. <laughs> and um, even in the audience in question, somebody said, refer to black women as colored. Super, super innocent. Last night, and one of my, uh, I'm also a mentor for Up to My Business Bootcamp, so as I'm mentoring, one of our folks referred to black people as colored. Nobody said anything, but I could see the shift in mannerisms and I could see the facial expressions on my melanin folks. <laughs> so after they shared, I said, group, can we offer any other language that he can use to um, address people of color? So they said, you know, you, you don't, you don't, you don't. And it was a, a cis white male who stepped up, was like, no, you don't, <laughs> you don't say um, colored. Um, and so, but that was a, you know, a, a chance of like to educate versus it turned into something else. It was awkward, but we all left it with like, okay, yeah, I didn't know. Thank you. Yeah. So I think, thank you for those stories, because I think, these are daily things that happen, right? Um, and I think one of the things that I've been thinking about is resilience is part of our lives, right? So for me, resilience is almost a given for a lot of people who've experienced trauma over and over again and who've lived our lives. Um, what's hard as an entrepreneur, now that I'm a first time entrepreneur, this is my first company, I've never done this before. What's hard on the flip side of resilience is dreaming. How do we, <laughs> I keep running into not dreaming big enough because that is not what I'm taught. And so I text with Brooklyn sometimes about manifesting our dreams. And I think that, I want to talk about that. Yeah. I want to talk about how do, we, how do we dream bigger because no one's pushing me to dream bigger. So my biggest advocates have been my friends and my you know, co-founder, B, and um, my you know, people who maybe done this work before, who's telling me you're not dreaming big enough, that goal is not big enough. Because I don't know what's possible, right? Until I've really stepped out of my comfort zone to allow myself to want something that I never thought I could have. And I think that kind of conversation in our community is really missing because we talk so much about trauma and resilience and I think that is what we're used to, that, we're, that we can do. We're good at that. But how do we envision Absolutely. something that we have not experienced before? How do we envision? Because that is the biggest roadblock, I think, for our community is not being able to envision something greater, better, bigger, because we have not been practicing that. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, sis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to hit that one. Um, so I'll, yeah, because I had to do this for myself. So I legit had to give myself permission to go, to dream yes. as, as high as, like, to, okay, no, there's trillion-dollar companies out right now, right? Like, I, I can't be shooting to be a millionaire. Like, there's billionaires out there right now. Um, and so I had to, one, just be clear and honest about the fact that, no, if my dream is to have the new Toyota Corolla, that I'm not quite in my lane, right? <laughs> just real. Um, and then I had to look at, okay, who looks like me around me? and who's going the biggest, right? And so a person who I specifically think about is a lady I call Miss Chris. Um, and she is running like 17 cannabis companies around the country right now. She's raising $50 million. And so that had to become not only that was the person I looked to, but then I just like reached out and called her and was made her check me on my goals and my my things and my choices. And she'll tell me all the time. She's like, "No, Brooklyn, if if you know these people, you're not you're not going big enough, girl. Like you gotta you gotta go bigger." Um, and so that's what it's been for me. Thank so, you. Um, I know Miss Chris too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> call her. <laughs> We could talk about this for literally six days, uh, but we only have uh, 35 seconds uh, left. So I'm wondering, um, on a final note, if each of you could share, um, you know, thinking about uh, our, you know, new mandate to, to dream bigger and to see and, and um, re-envision, reimagine what a world can look like and should look like. Uh, what do you need from folks to do to get out of the way 
of, of those dreams coming to fruition? I need people to be um, supporters, to not be um, haters. The question, when you hear somebody share an idea with you, how can I assist, right? What support do you need from, from me? Um, come back with ideas. Don't come back with stuff like, uh, well, that's going to take a lot of money. Well, don't you, that's going to take, you You know, that type of shade because we can self-doubt ourselves. We don't need you to do it too. Thank you. Brooklyn? Thank you. Uh, I love support. I think for me, it's it's free you, I'll free me, right? So, you know, if if you're already in your yes mindset, when I come to you, you're going to be good because you're doing your work. So, like, I think it's it's the same. You do you, I'm going to do me, we'll do it together. I think uh, for me, the big thing in my work as an outside is let's think about shifting the burden of labor from marginalized people to people who have more privileges. And that's not a monolithic group, right? I think I own um, multiple identities that give me privileges and I have identities that marginalize me and they can coexist. And I think it's realizing when can we use our power to shift that burden in different moments to empower people um, constantly. Um, and I think uh, in terms of the dreaming part, I think we need amplifiers. We need people who can check our dreams to dream bigger, who can believe in us uh, so that we can start practicing doing that for ourselves. Um, and yeah, we can talk about this forever, but I'm thank you for sharing the stage thank with you. me. The final thing I'll add to, to those requests is I need for us to have a real conversation about reparations and about what that means in 2018 and 2019 and beyond and about the ways in, we, in which we can innovate reparations and the ways in which we can uh, shift that labor. We can kind of take the abundance that is concentrated in certain parts of our society and, and move it into other parts of our society. So we thank you for taking the time to have this conversation and thank you to, to everyone here on the stage with me.